And we are here once again on a Thursday with the 9 o'clock drop on your hands. Paul Lyander with you once again. Graham Hill joining us here on the ones and twos as always as we get things rolling into a weekend. Today is a double-double. It's a 10-10-24, so we are already moving into this fine month of October. Lots of things to get to you. Lots of things to throw at you this morning. We'll see how much spaghetti can certainly stick to the wall and see if some of the discussions that we have today are truly done or if they haven't quite cooked up just enough yet. And so we're going to start here right now as we get ourselves ready for another fine NFL weekend in which we start things tonight with an NFC West showdown in Seattle and San Francisco is that we focus our attention, and this is where our attention is always focused, the Carolina Panthers. They are the team here of record when it comes to this great state. So we must devote some time to them. And some of you are like, why do you keep talking about a losing team? Well, it's because we want the losing team to win. We want to see that success. We don't want to see bags in the stands. We don't want you to turn away and not look and think, "Uh uh-oh, they left the truck on the tracks and the train's coming and there's no one to jumpstart it So that train's just going to blast into the truck and we'll just see what happens. That is every team right now facing the Carolina Panthers. This week's test just happens to be the Atlanta Falcons. As always, on Thursdays, you get to hear from two people, the quarterback and the head coach. The starting quarterback, and we are going to address him nicely, at least for this first few minutes, Andy Dalton. And he talks about what the Golden Retriever's message has been to the team so far. Yeah, I think you just stay the course. This is how NFL football works you know it's unfortunately sometimes you go through it you got some guys that get banged up and um, have some new guys in there but you know for us it's, it's building the team and I think that's everything that, that he's saying if we do what we know that we can do good things will happen and so just stay the course um, and uh, keep focused on things that we can control yeah Ouch. not ideal by any stretch of the imagination <laughs> You know, we... uh, But that's the bit. (coughs) Captain, uh, we've run out of fresh water, and uh, we have this slow leak in the bow, and uh, I'm not sure if we're going to make it to the island, but you know what? Just stay the course. Just stay the course. I mean, again, that's what I've been saying. That's the bit right now with the Carolina Panthers. There's no depth. It's obviously showing with how many guys are getting injured. And going back to what I said maybe Tuesday or Monday show, I can't remember what it was exactly, but I, I just don't know. And I'm not trying to play Debbie Downer here, Paul. I'm just trying to be a realist <laughs> okay, when I Debbie. say this. I just don't see how anything's going to improve moving forward for this team. You're not the only one that can't see through the fog that this Carolina Panthers ship is trying to sail through. They have so many injuries. I mean, this team is treading water, and they're treading water fast. And it's not a good team. They're not good. The injuries did not help them. But to begin with, you had 22 You had twenty-two starters. You really did. As an NFL team, to begin this season, you had 22 starters. The first hit started coming right away, even before the season started, right? And then Derek Brown goes down. You have Clowney kind of limping around. Dane Jackson is hurt. Josie Jewell. Uh, This list goes on and on and on. Adam Thielen. Okay, not going to forget anybody about that. So it's funny because I wrote down on this page in front of us in terms of the notes, can we see an aggressive Andy Dalton? And I look at everything around Andy Dalton, and I'm not sure if he can even try to be an aggressive Andy Dalton, Mr. Non-Smiley. And the reason why I put that out there is that, and I have scoured every bit of data coming into this program today, like over-prepped to be thinking to myself, how can I get Andy Dalton mad? But here's how I can get the fans mad, and I didn't intend it to be that way, but here's how I can get you mad. In terms of performance this weekend and projections, in terms of what all the data says, and this is all the web services and fantasy footballs and insider guys that literally look at how fast people run and how quickly they can get the ball out of their hands and whatnot. There are only, I say only, four quarterbacks that have are expected to have a lesser week than Andy Dalton this week against the Atlanta Falcons. And of those quarterbacks, three are getting their first starts of the season this weekend. That shows you how depleted this Panthers team is. Drake May, 
Oh, man, who are the uh... – you don't have to look far. Just look right back in conference down in New Orleans. Uh, yeah, I was about to say. Spencer, Spencer Rattler. Rattler. Yep. And Aiden, it yesterday. and Aiden O'Connell in Las Vegas. The team that the Panthers beat on the road. Jeez. Good for Drake, though. <laughs> yeah, and we'll talk about Drake May in a bit. So, as I try to go, man, how can Andy Dalton? I'm not sure he's able to get aggressive with this team. It's It's tough. It's tough. To soak in, it's tough to try to admit to yourself. And I'm a silver linings guy. I do like silver linings. There is no reason that Graham Hill should come in to this program two minutes into the show and goes, you know, I don't want to be a Debbie Downer. But if all that stuff points that way, and I'm a fan of Dave Canales. I really am. I really want to get in his corner. He's He feels like a head coach. He feels like the guy that's going to steer this ship. But, man, it is a it is a fog bank. But, uh, it is a full fog bank because I don't know where this team is going based on there's no identity anymore. Your your biggest horses that you had on this team to start the season aren't there. You're on your second quarterback who is a veteran quarterback. But again, when you look at stati- statistically speaking, there's not much that's going to happen no matter who you put in as the signal caller at this point. And now you're rolling in to a team with the Atlanta Falcons who feels like they have everything going their way. So much to when this game opened up earlier this week, it was minus four and a half, and now it's minus six. It, that, that spread keeps getting longer. So I'm not even sure. It's, and it's, it would be dishonest for me to tell you at this point that this is an underachieving Carolina Panthers team going into this sixth game of the season. There's not a lot of underachieving about. It's about setting, resetting the bar or whatever it is. And the currency in the NFL, as I've said many times, is getting wins. And I'm trying to figure out how this team can get another win. Andy Dalton. Again, we only hear from the quarterback and the head coach on Thursdays. Talked about the Falcons' defense. Yeah, I think for them it's the, the the players that they have. They're aggressive. They're smart. They understand the game really well. Um, I was with Jesse Bates for a couple of years in Cincy, so I know the type of player that he is. Uh, their front's a very veteran group, uh, guys that have played a ton of ball. And so uh, you throw it into just what th- that style of defense that, that, that they're bringing. I mean, they're aggressive. They're smart. They, um, they're running to the ball. I mean, they, they've played really well this year. And they're healthy. And they're healthy. And they're at the top of the table. Now, this isn't a monster, amazing defense, I think, as, as Andy Dalton's trying to put out there for you. He's trying to be very complimentary. Their new head, their defensive coordinator was the assistant head coach for the Rams last season. So he's come over and, you know, did what he did with the Rams. He's seen good defensive players. He's seen what defenses can do to dominate. He was part of some Super Bowl winning plays. And he was also head coach at the University of Washington. So he's got plenty of, you know, he's got the pedigree. There's no doubt about it. And he's being very complimentary to this Falcons defense. The Falcons are having to outscore opponents. There's no doubt about it. Which brings you to the fact that they are humming right now. They're humming in all the right directions, but they're playing close football games. Imagine if they hadn't picked Penix and gotten Kirk Cousins one more guy. Now, Cousins' 500-yard experience against Tampa Bay can be overlooked in some exper- it can be overlooked in some cases because he did throw for 500 yards and that's just not one of those things you see every day first time he had done it in his entire career but there is a reason why the Atlanta Falcons paid him a ton of money Kirk Cousins has a lot of weapons on that team Darnell Mooney Drake London among them the golden retriever Dave Canales talked about Kirk Cousins He's so dialed in. You know, he's just a student of the game. Um, he understands coverage. He understands the different attacks that a defense uh, tries to to put on their offense. You know, he understands his system. Um, so, you know, just the uh, the rhythmic way, um, <clears throat> the efficient way that he plays, getting the ball out quickly, finding those quick completions, knowing when he can take his shots. He kind of just has that sense about him. Um, and he's so accurate. He's been that way, you know, for his career. So I have so much respect. Respect, right? Respect, love, efficient, student of the game, all these kinds of things, super compliments. And what do you expect them to say, right? You don't need to give them any more bulls or more material because they're looking at you going, yeah, all right, we're going into Charlotte, see what happens, going to be a beautiful Sunday in North Carolina, and we're going to hang a 40 on them. I hate to say it for the Falcons, this was like essentially a bye week for them. Oh, 
as far as just in-game reps. And how do we – let's let's just take a hot pause here. Graham, you and me, you and I, you and I, let's be grammatically correct, you and I, trying to find some positives about this game for the Panthers before it's even been played. I'm like, how do we get aggressive and convince ourselves and convince those who are listening right now that the Panthers are going to get a win on Sunday? How do we do this? How do we do this? I'm looking at stats. I can't get past some of the stats. I'm looking at trying to find a way to get Andy Dalton aggressive and angry, and I'm looking for and I can't. I'm looking for a way to go, and uh, the guys at Panthers Playbook, Chris Lee and Dennis Cox, who just dropped a new podcast this morning, talked more about defense and how they need to figure things out on defense because they haven't, right? This has not been a very good year for the Carolina Panthers defense. How do we get ourselves out of the muck, right? It feels like we've been stepping in quicksand, and every time we try to dig ourselves out, Graham, you throw me a, a vine from the jungle, or I reach down with a really giant stick and say, come on out there with me, man. It's, it's not that bad. It's not that bad. We're okay. We have a win. It's one and four. We believe in the coach. We got a good runner in Chuba Hubbard, right? We got a guy in Chuba Hubbard. They can't stop talking about Chuba Hubbard. What can we do? And I'm not sure that answer is going to come this morning. I'm, 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 I'm trying. I'm not sure that answer is going to come this morning, but I think for this fan base and for the Panthers and just for NFL watchers aside, we have to figure out a way just to drag ourselves out of that because we find ourselves going right back to where we were last season. I mean, and, and it's true, right? Be honest with yourselves. It feels like you're leaning right back into last season going, oh, no, we suck again. <laughs> It's tough. And to quote the great wordsmith, Sabrina Carpenter, please, please, please don't prove I'm right. Wow. Please, please, please don't bring me to tears. That's a heck of a plug-in. I just, I'm trying. I'm trying. I want you all to try. Just try. Just once. But I get it. And I can feel it, too. And I'm feeling that weight come right back back on top of the fans and on top of those who are watching this team because you go, man, another injury. Oh, man, another long third down and whatever. Man, another one of those post-game speeches where Dave Canales talks about not winning in all the critical areas. God, I'm tired of that. I'm so tired of talking about red zone efficiency. I'm so disgusted with the idea of we have zero explosive plays. Like, how can we create that? Don't we have a brilliant offensive-minded offensive coordinator in Brad Idzik? Isn't that his gig? We focus so much on, on, on Coach Evero on the defensive side. Where's the offensive criticism? Where's that coming from? Can't keep ripping the defensive coordinator if he's got to keep his guys on the field all the time. Like, guys get tired, and he started only out with 11 dogs. He had 11. And they're trying to find more dogs on the waiver wire, and that's not how it works. Please, please, please don't prove I'm right. All right, friends. Paul Eihander here for FanDuel. Didn't think I'd dig into the Sabrina Carpenter, but there it is. Graham Hill with three things you need to know right now from 99.9 The Fan. Day one of ACC tip-off in Charlotte is in the books. Yesterday, out of our local teams, Duke and NC State had their chance to preview their upcoming season and discuss team goals. Today, it's UNC and Wake Forest that will have their chance to preview the upcoming 2024-25 college basketball season. Thursday night football is tonight between the San Francisco 49ers and the Seattle Seahawks. And you can hear play-by-play coverage right here on The Fan with pregame coverage starting at 7.30 and kickoff scheduled for 8.15. After the NCHSAA Board of Directors met this week, the association announced plans to change the fall sports calendar to allow schools affected by Hurricane Aline two weeks ago an opportunity to make up those missed games this season. Find these stories and more on WRLSportsFan.com. Paul Ihander with you on this Thursday morning. Graham Hill pressing the buttons, ones and twos, chiming in with the uh, updates as well. Appreciate him as now, always. Now basketball is my favorite sport. 
I love when they dribble up and down the court. Here you go. Sounds like a little bow wow, right? Is that who that was? No. That little bow wow? <laughs> Indeed. Yep. <laughs> See? Look at that, dude. Little bow wow. Uh, ACC Media Days underway in Charlotte. ACC tip off. Women and men, men taking center stage right now. A lot of uh, a lot of catch up to do certainly when it comes to the ACC and a lot of expectations in this conference of basketball. Uh, even though there's a lot of focus on football right now, clearly the conference of quarterbacks, ACC basketball season is just around the corner. And with 18 teams involved, there is a renewed sense of optimism when it comes to the ACC. Tim Donnelly, Dennis Cox, the drive. Uh, we're in Charlotte yesterday, back again there today from 3 to 6 this afternoon. Had a chance to touch base with a couple of the head coaches. First up, Duke head coach, John Shire. Coach, this is the first year you're you're uh, coaching, and there's no there's no Flip, there's no Roach, <laughs> there's no Mitchell. Felt like you guys were, were kind of growing together as, as a head coach and players. How is it breaking in some some newer faces? You know, Tim, it's been uh, it's been quite a ride the first two seasons, now going into year three. I couldn't be more excited. Uh, you know, miss some of those guys big time. I mean, Jeremy, what he's done for mm -hmm. our program for four years. Mark, his first two, gave us everything he had. And El Flip is, you know, shooting 75% from three <laughs> for the Jazz. But uh, but it is – it's a time to take a ne another step. Uh, I think we have a really good group. Just have to not skip steps and attack every day here. This offseason, your your guys were kind of all over the world, right? With right. with Malawash at the Olympics, Cooper Flag with Team USA. Uh, did that make it more difficult to not skip steps and and you know kind of be there for the day to day grind? Yeah, I mean it, it's you feel excited for both of them. You know, for Kaman to play in the Olympics at 17 is historic, mm -hmm. and that's such a special thing, especially for his country, which uh, the the pride that his country felt just seeing South Sudan on the Olympic stage is incredible. Cooper with Team USA, but it was less time together. And so the steps that we have to make, um, you know, probably didn't make as many in the summer as I would like, but their experiences, I know, uh, were well worth it. They were in the right spot, and we've been able to attack this preseason just going at it full steam ahead. John Shire, Duke's head basketball coach, joining us here at ACC Tip-Off. Um, the, the, the basketball stuff, I'll ask you in, in a second, but from the media perspective, I can tell you this. Um, Cooper Flag is really famous. Um, it's, you know, the, the Team USA select thing kind of took off and, and the, obviously, you know, the social media and everything else. Uh, do you prepare him differently because you, you know the eyeballs are going to be there? No, to be honest. Um, you know, I, I think uh, we understand for we understand what comes with Cooper and he's he's felt it before. I think it's just a different level, a different stage, different spotlight. Uh, our thing is is all about what we can control. So our approach on the daily basis and practice, the way Cooper prepares, we know we're going to have an incredibly difficult schedule to mm -hmm. start off the season, uh, which we're excited about. We want to go after it and and learn from it and grow. Uh, but our approach hasn't been any different, just because of the attention or. Cooper being famous or whatever, <laughs> uh, whatever may come with that. Uh, you bring up the, the schedule, Kentucky, Arizona, Kansas, in your first six games, the Arizona and Kansas games, essentially the same weekend, really right. it's, it's Friday and Tuesday. Uh, we saw recent years, there are entire conferences that are electing to like not play non-conference games right. like those. Why is it important that you test your team like that so early? Well, ultimately you know, I sat down and we thought as a staff, what's what's our goal? And our goal is to become the best team possible by the end of the season. And in order to do that, you have to put yourself in some different environments. And so we had the opportunity to play. We obviously were already playing the Champions Classic, but had the opportunity to play Arizona, mm -hmm. play road game, had the opportunity to play Kansas in Vegas. And then you think, well, that's why your guys chose Duke. That's why they want to come here is to play in these environments, to, to play against the best competition. So we're doing it. We're doing it. And I'm excited. And obviously we're preparing for, for those moments every day. Uh, but to me, that's, that's the reason behind it. John Shire, Tim Donnelly from Charlotte yesterday, ACC tip off. Don't worry, state fans. We got you covered too. Tim Donnelly also had a chat yesterday with, uh, Final Four head coach, reigning ACC tournament champion, NC State's Kevin Keats. Coach Kevin Keats is making his way on over to our table. We haven't talked uh, to him since the Canes Cup run. We haven't talked to him since the Canes Cup run. Coach, is 
in a good mood joining us here and for good reason is this is the defending ACC champion head coach at the ensuing ACC tip-off. So, uh, you know, the, the, the smile is well earned. Um, coach, I, I'm, I'm going to start maybe something you haven't been asked yet today. Yeah. Uh, I heard you weren't very good at ping pong. I'm the best. And, and it's like that, huh? Yeah, you know, I spent 12 years at Hargrave. And if you ever been to Hargrave, it's in Chatham, Virginia. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know, there's not a lot to do in Chatham, Virginia. <laughs> and so I spent a lot of time in the basement. Uh, I'm very picky about who I play. You have to beat somebody good before I play you. And it gives me a chance to get a scout report on you. I know how to look. You got to watch them in AAA before you call them up to I the majors. Watch them. That's right. Uh, so, the, the scouting, your, your brain just never turns off the no, scouting, right? You Everything's can't. watching film. You cannot. Um, how different will, will the team look? Not jumping to the basketball. How yeah. different will the team look this year? Because you, you've made a, a nice little habit over the last few years of, of turning over the roster with some transfer portal stuff, bringing in, bringing in guys. And, and this year is no different, even with the success of last year. Yeah, we have to find our identity. Um, and we lost uh, DJ Burns, who mm -hmm. I will never coach again. Nobody in college basketball will coach a guy just like him. We lost DJ Horn, who obviously could really score the ball. We lost Casey Morsell, who, uh, who had a really good year for us, defensively did some things. We lost Mo Diera, who was um, obviously the ACC mm -hmm. all-time, ACC tournament all-time rebounder. Mm -hmm. uh, that being said, we got three guys back, and, and Michael, JT, and Ben, who played a lot of minutes. You had Breon and Dennis Parker, who played early. We got five guys back, but we've got eight dudes who are still trying to figure out what NC State's about. I've asked Michael and them to teach the culture and let me teach the system. Uh, the culture is show them how to work. Show, how, show them how to play hard, and then I'll teach them how to play basketball in our system. It, it, you bring up the, the DJ Burns, like the, he's just a presence here. And I remember talking about it last year at ACC tip-off when he walked in the room, everybody just kind of stopped and turned and, and you, you gave him your attention. What's harder to replace, the, the basketball? Because he was a unique player on the court or the presence that was the unique player just in your program and, and person in the, in the room? You know, I it's equally both, but if you said pick one, you had mm -hmm. to pick one, it's the basketball player. <laughs> okay. I mean, because he became uh, um he could he could pass the ball. Mm -hmm. Uh if you didn't double him, you're crazy because he was gonna score. Uh if you doubled him, you're crazy <laughs> because he's gonna find the right guy. And then what happens is guys started making plays away from the basketball and making shots and everything else. Uh, he was as a, a unique a player that we may have seen. Uh, and, and college basketball just happened to have two of them, him and Zach Eady. They were completely different, but they both were unique. But we will never see those two guys uh, moving forward in college basketball. Big, strong stuff from both John Shire and Kevin Keats. Great to have them uh, part of our program. If you hadn't heard some of those uh, interviews, we wanted to bring those to you. And if you want to hear those full interviews, we do have them on our YouTube page, 99.9 The Fan. More coming this afternoon. Hubert Davis, uh, Dave Clausen, uh, Jeff Capel among some of the guests for uh, Dave Clausen. That's not right. That's Steve right. Forbes. Steve Forbes. I was like, wait a second. Got, got to wait for us. Got to just <laughs> switch like, him around. Wait there. a second. Uh, more this afternoon. ACC tip-off. Tim and Dennis in the drive uh, live from Charlotte, 3 to 6 this afternoon.